Nevada. This is Tina Drago and Jim Godwin coming to you live from the Beasley Broadcast Studio A in sunny Las Vegas. How are you doing today, Jim? I am doing splendidly. How are you, Tina? I'm doing absolutely wonderful. Healthy Nevada has wow. a new week here, doesn't it? We are going to be talking about all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah. A plethora of information. <laughs> <clears throat> Plethora, such a big word. So what I'd like to know is every week you do a newsletter and you send it out to all the powers that be in the state of Nevada. And you have great information in there. Well, thank you. Yeah, it goes out to about 300 people. It's called the Weekly Dispatch, and it comes out every Monday. So let's talk about what you share with just the elite. Let's share with the masses. Okay. Um, basically, the newsletter starts off with, uh, I have some health care news. Uh, <clears throat> for instance, in this week, we'll just run through it. We have a big thing. Um, HRSA is, uh, and what does that stand for, Tina? Uh, the Health Resource, Resource uh, yeah. Services, Services <laughs> Administration. <Yeah. laughs> Pop quiz. That's no fair. <laughs> you know, you know <laughs> no, what? You on the spot there. That is that is super 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 important because that grant money is what funds new federally qualified health care centers in our country. But this year, they've only set aside money for seventy five new centers. That is correct. In fact, there's a. A little little side note is uh, uh, through the National Association of Community Health Centers and HRSA and HHS, they've been doing a lot of uh, advocacy work to try and get uh, the funding for fiscal year 2017 um, a bit higher. It's a big drop from the way from where uh, well, how many did they funding has been? How many did they fund last go around? A hundred and. 50 or something? They yeah, were, it was like 150. So this is like Between 180 half. and 150 is a lot, yeah. Yeah, this is like Same half. with the, all the funding for community centers has uh, been cut a lot. So if you see anything to support community health centers, their radio listeners, click on it or go to it or lend your support. Well, you know what? As the CEO of an FQHC, First Person Complete Care, um, <laughs> my little shameful plug. Um, no, it, was, it was not shameful. It was, it was beautiful and smooth. <laughs> we have, um, I am a huge proponent on government supporting federally qualified health care centers, but I'm also equally as passionate about those health centers taking that those dollars and putting them together sustainable programs so that we don't have to scramble every fiscal year for legislation and we're biting our nails and wondering if Congress and Senate are going to close down the funding. I mean, we, we really should be responsible for what those dollars are going to dry up sooner or later. So we, we should be putting sustainable programs that can self fund. That is a, that is an excellent point And one that I wish was stressed more often, uh, considering how, uh, I'm, I'm bouncing my middle finger and pointer fingers up and down, as I say, we have a smoothly functioning government. So, uh, <laughs> are those air quotes important? Do you have, are air you, quotes. Are yes. you air quoting us? Um, yes, y- they, they call those uh, that gesture a different name that I can't say on the radio uh, <laughs> from the Daily Show. That makes me laugh. I think of every time I do it. So we'll just bleep, 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 bleep it out. Yeah. So. <laughs> So th- th- that's really important because, you know, I was reading the new access point grant that just came out because I have nothing better to do. And, hey, it's fun. And um, <laughs> literally 91 pages of instructions. But this NAP, unlike the previous three, has really, really um, narrowed its focus. And it's saying, listen, if you're going to apply, have your crap together. Give us a real plan, a real reasonable logistic plan about how you're going to get up and running. Give us a plan about how you're going to be sustainable. Talk to us about your community and what it's going to take to get your community to be more healthy. Um, More so than in the previous ones, it's been very rhetoric, um, government ease about, Mm -hmm. um, you know, step one, do this, step two, do this. Now they're actually explaining why you should be doing those steps. And um, which, it's a different approach. <laughs> which is a good thing. We were talking about the uh, I mean, people trying to catch up the NAP funding, which is the new access points for people either to open up a new federally qualified health center or, uh, if you already have one, to open up an additional site is what these awards right. are for. Right. 
And and what's important about that is like my my nonprofit clinic downtown, we have no federal funding. Everything we do is by our own bootstraps. And that makes a difference in the services that we can provide our our patients. And it also reduces, you know, because my my number one cost is labor, my providers, my staff. That's my Uh biggest overhead. And these grants allow me to not only pay my staff competitive wages with benefits so that we're stimulating the economy within the community, but the more providers I have, the more people we can see. And it and allows... I would just like to... Go on. Oh, I'd just like to say uh, I, uh, I am very proud of you and your uh, health center for pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and doing it on your own. And I, I just wanted to say that uh, I've never once seen you or anyone from first person with saggy boots. <laughs> no never sag- once, No so. saggy boots allowed. I think there's mm-hmm. a sign at the door. But we... Sorry to cut you off for that dumb joke. <laughs> you may continue. Okay. Dumb joke. <laughs> well, it was well received. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> but I, I, and I say to myself almost like weekly, Imagine what we could have done if we had some funding. Imagine what we could have done. Well, I know there must be other health centers across this country just like us that provide high-quality, cost-effective services to their community thinking the exact same thing. And that's what that new access point from HRSA is really there for. It's there for those medical centers that are that are really doing the right thing and just need that extra financial um, grease to make the wheels go a little smoother and provide mm-hmm. more services. Exactly. It's also important with uh, with all the uh, additional people that have health insurance. There's a little shortage of doctors and places to go. So anytime any new health care facility opens up, it is a good thing. I, I think so as well. I'm very pro that. Because you really have to take care of yourself before you can take care of other things. And that's a, a little adage that fits for everything from micro to macro. So uh, Take care of the basics first. So this new access point grant is like a major grant. It's not a minor grant. It's like a big, big deal. Um, so I'm I might be ornery over the next few weeks. Um, I'm going to apologize up front. Uh, <laughs> I actually have a sign on my door now that says uh, "nap in session." Uh, leave me, leave me alone. <laughs> so, so. My whole staff. So next knows. week, when you start off the radio show with uh, "This is healthy Nevada," it's a morning. <laughs> it's just another uh, day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> all grumbly. Um, <laughs> what's that cartoon? That old lady cartoon character. <laughs> that always has her coffee. Um, so it would be like that. Oh yeah. Yeah, <laughs> she's always got something snorky to say. Um, so, so that's a big part of the newsletter. That's a really big deal. What's what else is in your newsletter? Um, we're also featuring this uh, quality improvement um, tool that uh, us here at the NVPCA created. Um, and quality improvement is basically a consistent, systematic, and continuous actions that will lead to measurable improvement in healthcare services uh, and the, the health status of, of targeted patient groups. So this dashboard we created that goes on your computer um, tracks your clinic's outcomes on a monthly basis. Cool. And that's really important to have that uh, information and feedback to the healthcare team so uh, you have that valuable tool to improve your clinic processes and keep things running smoothly and um, make sure you're doing everything right and helping people out. And that's why sometimes when you go to the doctor, it takes a while. They have to ask all those questions and type them in. And a lot of that is for um, quality improvements. So they have this data to say, we check for this, check for that. This many people come in with diabetes and whatnot. So it's really important. And uh, Kim Lambrecht, an esteemed colleague of mine, she rocks. and Brandy Johns have created this great uh, dashboard that we offer to the community health centers to help keep track of all of their data and improve their uh, their health outcomes and improve so, their quality. So for our listening audience out there who thinks all these questions are intrusive and they don't know why they have to answer them every time. The truth of the matter is, is that the government and insurance companies and everybody is getting much more highly regulated. Because of our IT technology age, we can actually track our patients' performances better. And it's not going to be long. And I keep saying this, but I don't think anybody's listening to me out there, that 
the government, Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance, they're not going to pay doctors for doing mediocre work. And they're not going to pay doctors for not making their patients healthier and not helping their patients get on a care plan path that's going to succeed and make their patients feel better and look better and have longer, healthier, more productive lives. Um, the days of just going into your doctor and having them say, ah, and calling it a day and it is what it is and, hey, you're just getting old and that's why you ache are, are really coming to an end. Um, they're they're going to be looking at the, the doctor's performance of their patients. And I, I think that's something that we really need to recognize that this has been going on for a while quietly with meaningful use and patient-centered medical home. But this is all data tracking, and very quickly they're going to be able to see the performance models of providers. And they're going to see who's good and who isn't. They're going to take the good from the bad, and they're going to start rating them. (laughs) In fact, in the new Access Point grant that was out, they have an area in there that says they can basically look at the the clinic's ratings for the federal government, you know, have you been audited by Medicare and Medicaid? Have you, you know, all, all these things. And they, they're going to look at that and factor that into the new access point grant as well. And it's going to be the same thing for the provider. You know, 80% of your patient population um, hasn't, you know, has not successfully um, gotten off of, you know, insulin. Why is this? Why aren't we directing, you know, addressing these issues? It's good. It's going to be a problem. Fifty percent of your patient population is obese. You know, why aren't we working with them? What what can we do to help these patients be, become more healthier? And doctors are going to start being held accountable. It's going to be in. It's there. Trust me. Exactly, and it's these kind of precautions that uh, need to be taken uh, a little bit more often. That's why we have the big opioid overdose. Uh, crisis going on is because that wasn't regulated and people are getting hooked on those pain pills and you know you know it's funny and do, okay now you got me started on it you said opioid i mean honestly the doctors knew their patients were addicted the pharmacies knew their patients were addicted so much so that they came out with other medicine to help with const, opioid constipation um, mm-hmm. that the rehab centers are having o- drugs that suppress opiates in your system for overdose. I mean, they've had this like little side market going on when you knew the issue all along. You've mm-hmm. knew- <clears throat> These drugs were designed for surgical. These drugs were designed for one, two weeks max, not years. Exactly. So. And that's why cops now have to carry, all cops carry the overdose. Uh, I can't remember what it's called now. Mm-hmm. But if I could, I'd sound very smart and oh with, my, it. You'd with sound, it together you'd sound guy in healthcare. So brainiac. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that they it's almost like an EpiPen for drug overdose. You know? Yeah. And the numbers are remarkably shocking. Mm-hmm. So so the government's being like, hey, 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 you guys know what's going on. You know exactly what's expected of you. And yet you're still you're taking the lazy route, you're taking the quote, more profitable route because it's easy to just, you know, do a drive-by on a patient. That's what I call it when the doctors go in and don't spend a lot of time with you. Uh, So, (laughs) you know, just a... Well, it's a hard issue to address because everything is so uh, money-based. Exactly. And and profit-driven. And this is a long conversation. We can get into another day that has to do with big pharmaceutical companies and uh, but I would like to just swing it around really quick and wrap it up to why community health centers are so great and essential is that they're not there for a profit. They are mission-driven. I love to, the bow. You just put a little bow on that whole thing. That was great. I know, and a nice ribbon, some sparkles. Yes. It is, and yeah. FQHCs are mission-driven. We're not here to get rich. We're not going to be retiring on this. I mean, we're, we're about doing the right thing for our community. You have a community that's not drug dependent. You have a community that's healthy. You have a community that's not obese. Then you have a community that does that spends less money in the ER. You have a community with lower tax um, thresholds. And exactly, and more or less tax money yeah. uh, that goes to emergency room and all that kind of stuff, and can go back into the community for education and playgrounds and helping out homeless and all kinds of stuff. Um, I don't know. So when you hear non. I, I don't know if you know uh, what the number is up in Reno, but in Las Vegas, it's somewhere like between 65 and $80 million a year goes to UMC just for their ER. Oh, yeah, I believe it. Crazy. Imagine what we could do with that money in the school districts. Oh, gee, Louise. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, what's what's All your right. next what's your next topic on there? Uh, next, under the community health category, um, is this paper written by the Agency for Health and Health Research and Quality (AHRQ). Uh, and their paper is entitled uh, Creating Patient-Centered Team-Based Primary Care, which um, the patient-centered uh, community health centers, over 75, 80% of the community health centers, or over half of the community health centers are patient-centered medical home, which is an initiative we at the MVPCA push a lot, and a lot of our uh, federally qualified health centers are yeah. uh, patient-centered medical home certified, and we pushed through legislation um, not last year. Yeah, last year. Last year. Year before last. Yeah, last year. We pushed the meditation uh, or legisla- legislation. <laughs> My mouth is not working so well. Uh, to put language for patient-centered medical home into law, and it's it's a great thing where it's just focused on the patient and a team of people uh, working on that patient. And it, the paper kind of shows you how a team-based care can improve the quality and comprehensiveness of the primary care. And then also how when you have that team-based approach, you'll have behavioral health and and just your uh, primary care provider and nurses and different specialists all working on you and your health at the same time as you have a well-rounded, holistic um, approach to your health care. And sometimes there's Although that's a very good thing and provides you a comprehensive look at how you're doing and make sure everything is being taken care of, but it does uh, kind of might cause a little changes or disruptions in relationships because people are used to seeing just the one doctor. So this paper uh, also addresses um, different approaches to maneuver through that new uh, relationship dynamic. So and, uh, it, let's just really, take a sample patient comes in and um, let's let's make this patient complex. We have a veteran, you know, an ex-vet. I don't know if they're ever ex, but we have a veteran. No. He has some PTSD. He also has hypertension, diabetes, a um, little overweight. And we have this and our job is to help him create a care plan to to get healthy. But we have to take into consideration all aspects of this person because he isn't just a single one-off plug and play. He's complex like each one of us is. So we need behavioral to help us with the PTSD and they will help us with the diagnosis. But that drug may be counteractive to his diabetes or his hypertension medicine. So we also need a pharmacist to come in. And we need the pharmacist to tell us how the drug manage, how the drug should be managed and what we're going to do with that. And then we may need a nutritionalist to come in to work on their specific dietary needs and, you know, and, and exercise program. And we have our, and then we have our primary care provider that loops all these people together so that when they're sitting down talking about this one person, they're addressing every aspect of this person's needs, coming up with a comprehensive care plan designed specifically for them so that they succeed. And that's what Patient Center Medical Home is about. It really is. It wraps everybody around so that nothing's being missed. Because when you go to a specialist and your specialist isn't talking to your primary care, that's a real issue because they could be taking you down one path and the primary care is taking you on another path and you're kind of lost in the middle and neither one does the best for the patient. And that's why they call it Patient Centered Medical Home. It forces all the providers to come together. I break it down. <laughs> well put, Tina Drago. Well put. I always like using examples. Maybe it's the teacher. Actually, I had a great illustration up on deck, ready to step up to home plate and knock it over the park. And so you know go what do happened? it. Go do it. Tina Babe Ruth Drago came in <laughs> and I'm just so powered sorry. right on over, cleared the bases. <laughs> Beautiful. This is what happens when we're, we're we're talking over the phone and we don't really uh, see each other eye to eye because you'd be giving that look like, "Hey, man, I already have this set up." <laughs> oh no, yours was was far superior. So in this particular case instance, the uh, the listener profited from us not being able to see each other. So what else did we and, talk uh, about in our in our newsletter? Um, uh, we do have a big grant coming up, the American Dental Association semi-annual grant program. I'm going to be all over that. All over yeah, that. It's, it's, it's from a guy who's getting uh, two root canals next week. It is very important to take <laughs> to yeah. uh, take 
pay careful attention to your oral health care. So we are taking over the Huntridge Teen Clinic down here in Las Vegas, and it has four dental chairs. And it's a little outdated, and this grant would really help us kind of modernize and get it up to snuff when it comes to, like, the um, radiology or, you know, the x-ray machines mm-hmm. and stuff. And give the, um, the students and the, and the professors that come in and work and the volunteer in there, give them um, better tools to work with. I would love to have that for this. Yeah, well, and it's also great because oral health and going to see the dentist is so important. And I have a huge, tremendous anxiety of going to the dentist. Really? But Oh, yeah. Oh, it wears <laughs> me out. <laughs> One of my favorite uh, lines is from a William Soroyan play, uh, Time of My Life, and uh, one character is insulting another character, and he says, you dentist. <laughs> I do love dentists. All dentists. I'm not an anti-dentite, um, just so everyone knows. I just have an anxiety about the dentist that I'm working on, but it's really important. It's also expensive, and dental insurance doesn't doesn't cover a lot. No, it doesn't. No, it does not, as I can also attest to. So one nice thing about having um, oral health care in your community health centers is they are, and I like how our newsletter just segues so nicely together. Uh, when you have that, you can go in and get your dental work done and pay on a sliding fee scale. Yes, it's you not can. So, uh, outrageous and impossible yes. as um, seeing a regular, seeing a dentist with health insurance, with dental insurance. So it's very crucial, and I think it helps people pay more attention to that because a lot of people uh, let that kind of stuff slide. So I, I went to Marquette for undergrad, and they have a phenomenal dental program there. And one of my besties was in the dental school, and she became a dentist. And she is like that blonde, blue-eyed, bubbly... Uh, well-endowed woman. And for some reason, she has no problem putting people at ease when she goes into <laughs> work on them. So I made that sure... That is a beautiful skill. <laughs> I made sure that when my boys were growing up, that their dentist was a... And, a, and this is very sexist, so I'm just going to say it, but um, they found her hot. And so <laughs> they, they never um, they never really had any anxiety. They were actually looking forward to going to the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> so so you maybe go. you need Sometimes. a hot dentist. Not that your wife exactly. would mind much, but <laughs> you, you might enjoy going. <laughs> Sometimes the superficial can help you out. Yes. Yes. Um so this this is wonderful. This was a great show. I like your newsletter um, segue into this. I think this will go. Is there anything else in the newsletter? Was there any little other tidbits? We have a couple more minutes left. Oh, well, we just have a, a training uh, that we're putting on with the Arizona Alliance of Community Health Centers. They are the Arizona equivalent of the Nevada Primary Care Association. I just registered. Uh, yeah. Oh, good. Good for yeah. you. We're doing a federal tort claims university. Uh, to help our members of the health center community uh, learn more about the Federal Torts Claim Act. You can Google it. It's quite interesting. It's it's all and legalese, I, but it's risk management, and it's making sure that we run our businesses as um, profitable and effective as we can and staying within the guidelines. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So we have that training we're doing uh, down in beautiful Las Vegas. Yep. In May, uh, right? Exactly, with our sister organization, which I, I love, the Arizona Alliance community. They're great. They do a really good job. But I also like them because when they say, oh, yeah, we're uh, over at the Alliance, we're doing this, whereas I say over at the Primary Care Association, so are you and the Alliance <laughs> just sounds so much more Star Wars-y. Are you, are, you cool. thinking, are you thinking we should rename the PCA one more time and make it something kind of fun? Um, no, because that would be just double my workload. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only reason we don't do the Star Wars Alliance. <laughs> well, so we have that, and then we, we have uh, some other, I uh, do a lot of different webinars and, and trainings I highlight in the newsletter as well. And then I always end it with a cool graphic and a nice quote. Are we almost out of time here? Yes, we are. Give us the quote. Uh, it's from uh, one of my favorites, Joseph Campbell. And the quote is, the goal of life is to make your heartbeat match the beat of the universe. To match your nature with nature. Awesome. Awesome. Love it. There we go. 
That sounds wonderful. I could I could really get into that. Well, it's, it's a good one. <laughs> this is Tina Drago and Jim Godwin coming to you live from the Beasley Broadcast Studios for Healthy Nevada. I hope you've learned something good today. Stay healthy, Nevada.